Question for you, title of the message, Tools for Growing in Wisdom. Tools for Growing in Wisdom. And here's my question. You ready for a question? I won't ask you to raise your hands, although I'd really like to. Uh, what would you rather have, be honest, if you could have the ability to be stunningly gorgeous? We're talking Brad Pitt handsome. We're talking Ryan Gosling handsome. My daughter loves Ryan Gosling. I've watched every movie he has had with my daughter just to get couch time with my daughter. Uh, if you could be incredibly handsome, incredibly gorgeous, supermodel gorgeous, or have wisdom, which one would you choose? Yeah, think about it. Because now I'm going to ask you, if your answer was wisdom, are you pursuing it? Oh, I know we work hard to look good. We straighten our hair. We put on our makeup. We hit the bench press. But do we pursue wisdom? David, a man after God's own heart, King David, told his son, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. Yeah, that was his instruction. That was his fatherly counsel. That was how he raised his son. And Solomon, when God appeared before him, he said, hey, I don't know how to, he just inherited the kingdom. He says, I don't know how to go in. I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to lead all these people. I don't know how to lead the strongest nation in the world at that time. I don't know how to do all these things. Lord, give me wisdom. And that request pleased the Lord. The Lord said, I love that you asked for that. Why? Because wisdom is the principal thing. Are you valuing it? Are you seeking it? Do you desire to have it in your life? Because the Bible says that we are to go after it, that we are to grasp it, that we are to lay hold of it, that we are to seek it out. The Proverbs say, by wisdom a house is built, and its rooms are filled with many pleasant things. When he says a house is built, he's not talking about a dwelling structure. He's talking about a dwelling structure, our bodies. By wisdom a life is built. By wisdom a life is filled with incredible things. Wisdom. Above all else, get wisdom. Are you pursuing it? Today, we're going to see James giving us some tools to grow in wisdom. We're on a series called Life Tools. We've been looking at how James is instructing us, and the book is pretty practical. It, it, it hits pretty hard. But I want you to know this. Don't miss out on James' heart. He was a man who failed miserably. He was Jesus' brother, we've been learning and he did not even recognize that Jesus was the Messiah until Jesus rose from the grave and he saw him in his resurrected form. And he had tremendous regret. And so what James does is he now pens this book to give us practical tools so that we might have all that God wants us to have in life. Why? Because, well, your wife might go through a hard thing as she takes care of a family member. Why? Because, well, your wife might get pregnant. Why? Because, well, your marriage might hit a rock. Why? Because, well, you might go through a layoff and, oh, there is no shortage of problems. But by wisdom, the house is built and it's filled with glorious things. By wisdom, even the trials become stepping stones to bring our life to be used more for the glory of God, to make our life be something that shines brightly. And so with that, we want to look at some tools James gives us to grow in wisdom. Open up your Bibles. We're going to pick up right on the verse we left off on, chapter 3, verse 13. Gil, buddy, are you, uh, 
are you, can you tell if the air conditioner's on? How many of you feel a little stuffy? You're already working on it? All right. If we can't get it, can we get some doors open? And here's a tip before we get started. Here's a tip. If you like the worship quieter when we sing songs, sit up front. I know it's counterintuitive, but this room, sound bounces in a way where it's way louder in the back than it is in the front. So if you're sitting in the back because you like it quieter, it's, there's no wisdom in that. Uh, sit up front and it'll be quieter, and if you like it loud, sit in the back. So um, no charge for that advice. Um, let's jump in. Lord, speak to us from your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. We are starving and hungry people, and we need to be fed by you. Lord, give us an ear to hear the wisdom you would speak to us, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works, his behaviors, his actions, they are done in the meekness of wisdom. Wow, interesting choice of words. Done in the meekness of wisdom. Right off the bat, here's what we learn. Mis wisdom brings meekness. Wisdom brings meekness. Here's what he says. You think you're wise? Yeah, there were a lot of people wanting to be teachers, wanting to have authority, wanting to say, hey, I want to be in charge. James says, hey, let not many of you go after that route. Have a humble mindset. And if you really think you are wise, verse 13, look at this. Let him show it by good conduct. That his works are done with meekness and with wisdom. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, or in other words, self-interest all the time, you're always just thinking about you and raising yourself, and you have selfishness in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, listen, if you are always on your mind, if you're trying to elevate yourself, don't lie and boast against the truth. Or in other words, don't think you're so godly. Don't think you're so right. Don't think that just because you've been a Christian for 20 years that you've got this all figured out. No, no, no. Acknowledge what's really going on. Don't think that you're so smart. Why? Well, he tells us why. Verse 15. Because this wisdom, this selfish thinking, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Wow, crazy. You know what we see here? There's such thing as demonic wisdom. Last time when we got together in chapter 2, verse 19, we learned that there was demonic faith. Do you remember what demonic faith is? How many of you remember what demonic faith is from our talk a week or two ago? Demonic faith, what is it? It's James says, you believe in God, you do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. What is demonic faith? Here's what it is. It's believing that Jesus came, that he was God, that he died on the cross. Intellectually, I believe, yeah, I believe all that. But he's not Lord of your life. That's demonic faith. And he says the demons believe that, but he's not Lord of their life. And just because you believe doesn't mean you, you might have faith, but it might be demonic faith. Uh, a scary title, all it means is Jesus isn't Lord of your life. You believe it, but it's just intellectual. It's not being lived out in your life. Well, here he says there's also demonic wisdom. Look at verse 15. This kind of wisdom, this selfish wisdom that's all about our gain and our elevating ourselves. Here's what he says. It doesn't descend from above. It's not from God. As a matter of fact, it's earthly, sensual, and demonic. Here's what he's saying. Just like there's demonic faith, there's also demonic wisdom. And just like demonic faith, Jesus isn't Lord of your life. Well, demonic wisdom, you know what it is? It's manipulative. It's manipulating and scheming to get ahead and being pretty smart at it, pretty good at it. And you use your natural resources to elevate yourself above others because, uh, you know, you're, 
Your, only, your self-interest is the only thing on your mind. And you think you're so smart when you do it. You step on someone, and you lie, and you cheat, and you make it work, and it works. You get the deal. You get the bonus. You, get the, you win the argument, whatever, and you walk away, and you go, pretty smart, man. And you actually, and he says, hey, look, that kind of wisdom is not from God. It's earthly. It's sensual and demonic. Verse 16. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. I want you to underline something for me. I want you to circle it. It's really staggering that the Bible uses these words. Every evil thing. Will you circle that for me? Say that with me, church. Every evil thing. What's he saying? Here's what he's saying. Look at 16. Where envy is. What is envy? Envy is the desire to be great. The entitlement idea, like I deserve, I deserve envy. Ego. Where envy is and self-seeking. Selfishness, where envy and selfishness are, here's what it says. There's confusion and every evil thing. What does he mean, every evil thing? Don't answer out loud, but let some evil things start running through your mind. What runs through your mind? What are evil things? Lying, cheating, manipulation, theft, deceit, rape. What goes through your mind? Look at these things. Self-righteousness, cruelty. Look what he says. When selfishness is reigning... Every evil thing is there. Wow. Wow. That kind of wisdom, look what it produces. It's not from God. It's demonic. And the fruits of it are evil. And thankfully, verse 17 changes the corner. Look what he says. But, the good news is, is there's a, There's a but. But the wisdom that is from above, the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Pure. I want you to circle the word pure. What does pure mean? It means there's no ulterior motive. No deception involved. No pretense. No hypocrisy. No mask. It's the real deal. The wisdom that is from above, it's just pure. It's just pure, no pretense whatsoever. And look at this, because it's pure, it's then peaceable, and it's gentle, and it's willing to yield, and it's full of mercy, full of good fruits, and it's without partiality, and it's without hypocrisy. You know what it is? It's life-giving. It's life-building. It'll make you an amazing husband. It'll make you an amazing wife. It'll make you an amazing parent building your kids and and the fruit that comes out of it. Instead of flying off the handle and breaking little hearts, instead you'll be building lives. In the workplace, it will set you apart above all others. Daniel was a man that was filled with wisdom. And in the workplace, the king could see, wow, there is something special about this guy. And he just stood out. I tell you what, our VBS team was at that spiritual center. We, rent, we rented their building there. And, you know, they, they believe in everything, everything. Uh, you can say a dog is your God, and they say, no problem, you can believe that. It's a universalist kind of uh, religion. And you know what's weird about it? Our group had so much more what? Love. Love. There was a group of, I don't know, 15 leaders there every single day, and everyone there had this to say, wow, we can see the love of Jesus Christ in this group. We mopped their floors. We did their windows. We made it better than we found it. We fed them. We loved them. We poured out. And they just said, On the last day, one of the gals, the gal who has been there 20-something years, 
she tells one of the leaders, I think I want to visit your church. Wow, how's that happen? Well, because wisdom builds the house. It causes you to stand out. Look at these qualities in verse 17. And oh, don't you want those in your life? Pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, full of good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Verse 18, now the fruit of righteousness. Circle these two words for me. What are the next two words? The fruit of righteousness. What does it say? Out loud, all together as a church. The fruit of righteousness is sown. You know what that is? What is sown? Planted. You know what that is? It's a verb. It's an action. It's something we pursue. The fruit of righteousness is sown. Yeah, wisdom is sought after. It's gone after. It's sown in peace by those who make peace. I love that. Here we see this is the the difference between godly wisdom and demonic wisdom. Godly wisdom, what does it do? It produces some amazing attributes. Peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, produces great fruit. It's sown in peace. It produces peace. And it just builds. Demonic wisdom, yeah, every evil thing is there. And we see the difference between godly wisdom and worldly wisdom. There's different wisdom. What kind of wisdom do you have, Christian? Are you walking around with worldly wisdom? Do you scheme? Do you figure out how to get a deal? Are you savvy? Street smarts, quick on your feet, able to get out of a jam? It's worldly wisdom. And what it produces is broken lives. But godly wisdom, on the other hand, very powerful, life-giving. And now James is going to give us a pop quiz, as he so often does. And he's going to say, hey, are you wise? Do you think you're wise? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what's going on in your life. Do you have godly wisdom? And he's going to give us a very practical pop quiz. Are you ready for a pop quiz? How many of you like pop quizzes in school? What are you, nuts? What are you raising your hand for? hated pop quizzes. Why? Because it showed I didn't do my homework. Showed I wasn't prepared. Showed I didn't study. Well, James is going to throw a pop quiz, not about a subject, about life. About life. Let's look at what he says, chapter 4. Where do quarrels and fights come from among you? Great question. Hey, got a question for you, a pop quiz. Why are you guys fighting all the time? Where do these problems come up in your life? How come you're not getting along with so-and-so at work? Where do quarrels and fights come from among you? In case you didn't know, I'm going to answer the question for you, James says. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war within your members? Doesn't it come from your passion to get what you want in life? Doesn't it come because you didn't get your way? Doesn't it come because you want something? Verse 2, you lust, you desire something, you got a longing, got a hankering for it, and you don't have it. And so you murder. And you say, well, wait a minute, I've never murdered anybody. Oh, not by the definition that, that Jesus gives. When we stomp on a friend when we burn a relationship we have murdered we have killed that friendship and we can easily kill friends and people and when we gossip about someone we don't like what they did and we start saying yeah did you see what jim did i can't believe jim stinking jim or i can't believe sally or i can't believe dave or yeah look what dave did you just can you believe it what are we doing We are murdering that person's reputation. We are slandering. And God calls it murder. He says, listen, you lust and you do not have. And so what do you do? You murder. You covet. You start desiring. I can't believe they got it. I want that. And you cannot obtain. And so you fight and you war. Interesting pop quiz. Where do these problems come, James says? Look what happens. 
Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask, and then you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. I want a little feedback right here. What does he mean by spend it on your pleasures? What does he mean? Out loud. For yourself. What else? Just shout it out. Everybody, make some noise. What was that? Anybody else? Ah, really good. Using it for your own personal gain. Not caring about how it affects anybody else is just for the me monster. Yeah, yeah, all, all about me. You do it for, just to spend it on your own appetites. And so let's break this down. Let's look at a couple of things he says here. One of the things that he says is, hey, where do these fights come from among you? Well, one of the reasons they come is because you want something and you don't get it. And you know why you don't get it, he says? Why does he say, first reason we don't get it? Because we don't ask. Hey, I want you to know something. All eyes up here. People cannot read your mind. Loved ones cannot read your mind. If you're married right now, look at your spouse and say, I'm sorry I've asked you to read my mind. And what James is saying right here, he's saying, hey, look, you do not have because you do not ask. Therefore, do what? Ask. Yeah, why is it we have such a hard time asking for things that we need? Is it because of our pride? We want to stay strong? We don't want to look like we need anything? Maybe. Is it because we're embarrassed about what we need and we're kind of feeling selfish? Maybe. Is it because we are too selfish and we just need too much? It's always about me? Maybe. But here's what James says. The tongue is a powerful tool we learned last week. Therefore, when you have things that you need, use your language. Communicate your heart. Share yourself to your spouse, to your friends. Don't think they know what you need. I had a friend tell me this week, hey, I really need you right now. And you've kind of let me down. I don't even, wow, I didn't realize that. I thought I was right there tracking with you. No, you know what? I left going, I so appreciate that. I so appreciate that kind of friendship that's real and that comes to me and says, hey, look, I, I need more. It might not be realistic. It might be realistic. It might, might be expected. It doesn't matter. Here's where I'm at. I need this right now. And here's what I know about this person. Very giving, very selfless. And so if their request is valid or not, who cares? Man, this is what they need. I want to help. I want to help. We cried together and go, man, gosh, thanks for telling me. How much different would your marriage look, would your real important relationships look, if you just did what? Ask. Now let's move to God. How much more if we just ask? Jesus loves to give. I've got a secret for you. Do you want to know something? Jesus is filthy rich. Did you know that? He doesn't have a lot of money. He has a lot of banks. He owns every bank there is. Not only that, he owns the land the bank is on. Not only that, he owns the property the bank is on. Not only that, he owns the guy who has the title deed to the bank. He owns everything. The Bible puts it this way. Uh, I'm just trying to paraphrase what the Bible said thousands of years ago. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In other words, he owns the bank vaults in a thousand banks. That's what cattle were back then. They were little cash cows walking around. Jesus is rich. 
He has everything. And you know what he tells us? Ask. Ask. Jesus loves to give to us. Jesus said, ask, seek, knock. It'll be given to you. Actually, let's just read it. It's Matthew 7, 7. Super easy verse to remember. 7, 7. Matthew 7, 7. Look what this verse says. Read it out loud with me, church. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. You know what the problem is? We don't believe it. We just don't believe it. Yeah, I heard that verse before. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in church. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, just ask. But we go home and we don't ask. Why don't we ask? Don't believe it. Here's why we don't believe it. Because I asked before. And I didn't get it. Hey, I don't want you to miss the truth of this verse just because you experienced something different. We'll get to that in just a minute. Let me bring you back to just a plain, flat-out truth. Jesus is not a liar. He said, I go to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm coming again. And guess what? He's coming again. He went to the cross to prepare a place for us. And he came again. He rose three days later and said, see, I told you I had power over death. You can trust me. And so we can trust Jesus. He says, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, there's the difference. It's in my name. In my name. In line with the will and character of God. I remember when my kids were little. My son Jordan asked for a shotgun when he was about six years old. I'm not kidding. Asked for a shotgun at six years old. I said, buddy, don't you mean a BB gun? He goes, no. I mean a shotgun. Well, he asked, and I'm his dad, and I love giving him good gifts. What was the problem? Yeah, he's not ready for that. That shotgun would kill him. And, uh, you know, we had certain milestone birthdays in our kids' lives. Seven years old was a milestone birthday. You got your first pocket knife at seven years old. But you couldn't touch it. You could only look at it unless dad was with you. If dad was with you, you could touch it and do whatever you wanted to do. But dad had to be with you. And so we had different milestone birthdays that allowed them to get what they want. What's my point? Hey, God is a good father. And he's not going to give us things that destroy us. He goes on to say, look, you ask and you do not receive because you ask a myth that you spend it on your pleasures. If we ask something that isn't good for us, uh, that's just for selfishness sake, God says, no, 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 I'm not going to give that to you. Why? Because it will destroy you. You'll cut your hand off, you'll shoot your eye out with that thing. No way, I'm not going to give you that. And so we then think, well, then this promise isn't true. And nothing could be further from the truth. Ask. Ask. God loves to pour his blessings into our life. He says, if we ask amiss, if we ask selfishly, if we ask for our own personal gain, we're not going to receive it. If we ask, we're not going to receive if we ask selfishly. Who are we not going to receive from? God or man? If we ask, and we ask with selfish desires, we're not going to receive it because we ask amiss that we ask. Who's not going to give it to us, God or man? Let me hear you vote. How many of you think God? How many of you think man? Someone raise your hand. Okay, you were right. You were right. It's both. If we ask with selfish motives, we're not going to receive from God or man. Let me just illustrate it for you. Not hard to figure out. If you ask man, say you go to work and you tell your boss, hey, you go to your company and say, hey, look, I'd like to be the boss of this place. Why? Because I just like having authority and I want to make a lot of money. Are you going to get the promotion? No. Why? Because you asked a miss that you may spend it on your pleasure. You made it all about you. You're just trying to elevate yourself. Yeah, but I tell you what, you come here and you build this company. You come here and you don't ask for yourself, but you come to build. And guess what's happened? Yeah, then 
When you ask with right motives, you're going to receive from man. Guys, try this one. Go to your wife and say, hey, look, Bible says so. You need to submit to me because I'm the head of the family. Are you going to receive it? Not a chance. Not a chance. If you do that, you're a maroon. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Because you ask a miss that you might spend it on your pleasure. Instead, men, come and build your wife. Show that you put her needs above your own. Show that your family is the most important thing to you. Come in and show what real wisdom is. And you know what happened? You will have what you ask. You will have the respect. Your wife will go, wow. And so here he says, listen, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasures. You don't receive from who? You don't receive from God and you don't receive from man. And yet if you ask with the right motives, you're going to receive and you'll be really blessed. Where do these wars and fights come from among you, he goes on to say? Don't they come from your desires at battle within? You want something, you don't get it, you kill, you covet, you fight, you murder. Look what he's saying. He's saying these problems, they have a common, common theme in your life. They're coming from inside you. Let me ask you, what, what was the cause of the last fight you had? Think back to the last fight you had. Could be at work, could be at home, could be with extended family, could be with a neighbor. What was the last fight you had? Think about it real quick. You got it? I mean literally, think about it. What was your last fight? You got it in your mind? Take a moment. I'll wait. Okay. That last fight, what caused that battle you were in? Was it because you didn't get your way? Was it because something happened to you that you did not like? What was it about? Oh, maybe it was about, hey, why do your parents have to stay with us this time? They always stay with us. Can't they stay with your sister this time? Why do we have to help out your mom? Can't your brother do that? What was the last fight? Why did he get the promotion? I can't believe they did that to me. And you know what James is declaring to us? Here's a main point I want us to really grasp. Here's a main point. The desire to get our own way is the root of our problems. The desire to get our own way is the root of our problems. I wanted to put it this way on your screens, but I don't think it's grammar grammarly co correct. I wanted it to say, my desire to get my way is the root of my problems. If you're writing it down, it's probably a better way to write it down. My desire to get my way is the root of my problems. Where do all your problems come from? It's my desire to get my way. That's the root of all my problems. What if you just change that desire? That's what James is trying to bring us into wisdom of. What if you did it differently? Selfishness and greed create tremendous problems in our lives. We want more money. We want more respect. We want more status. We want more possessions. We want more recognition. We want, 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 want. And our desire for more is the source of our problems. And you know what happens? When we get selfish like this, when we start wanting more and and we have this selfish passion, do you know what happens? It ruins, it damages relationships. It damages friendships. Selfishness damages people that we really love. And you know what else selfishness damages? Our wisdom. And it turns what should be godly wisdom, and it flushes it down the drain, and it turns it into demonic wisdom. And we don't grow. And we wonder why we don't experience more fruit in our life. Jesus was really concerned. He didn't want our desire, our selfishness, the desire for our own way to cause so many problems in our life. And so you know what he said? Let's look at what he said. Um, 
Luke 12, 15, on your screens. Read it out loud with me. Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Take heed. You know what take heed means? Pay really careful attention. Listen carefully to me on this, Jesus is saying. Please really hear me on this, Jesus is saying. Beware of covetousness. It will ruin your life. Why? Because Jesus knew that our desire to get our way is the root of all of our problems. You know what selfishness does in my life? It deceives me. It deceives me. It makes me unsatisfied. It makes me wanting more. And it deceives me. It tells me that other people are the problem instead of me. That's what selfishness does. You see, it's not me. It's, it's not really me. It's my coworkers. If my coworkers would all just change, I'd really like working here. Yeah, that might not be right thinking. If my brother would just change, uh, uh, we might have a. If if all these lame drivers weren't on the road, it'd be so much better. Yeah, it might not be everybody else. You know what we do? We say, yeah. Well, I didn't get the promotion. You know why? Because my boss doesn't like me. Really? Really? There might be some deception there. You think your boss doesn't like you. What he's really trying to do is keep the company from advancing by his dislike of you. Does that make sense? Probably not. And James is saying, hey, don't let that hinder our wisdom. We think that if we got more, we'd be happy. If he would just date me, I'd be happy. If he would just uh, marry me, I'd be happy. I almost said mate me. That'd be horrible. Uh, If he would just marry me, we'd be happy. If we could just get a house together, we'd be happy. And all that happens, then, then, then this happens. If he would just pick up his shoes in the living room, I'd be happy. Right? We always think it's something else. But it's not. It's our desires that battle within. On the second day of vacation Bible school, there was this bo- little boy there, and uh, they were playing this game. It was an awesome game. Uh, Galen had just, he just killed it on these games, and, and I, I happened to be there for this. I got to see this. They had a, a net on the grass spread up, kind of like a volleyball net, only it was low, and Galen made just hundreds of throwing objects that were all wet, wet balls, wet sponges, wet slimy things. And he said, you got three minutes, and he put them into teams, one on each side, and he said, here's what we do. The team that gets the most on the other side at three minutes wins. Everybody ready? And this boy goes, wait, wait, wait. And the game started. And this little boy, you know, the sponges are flying, water's flying, slime is flying, kids are getting splattered, it was awesome. Uh. And this one little boy, instead of having fun, guess what he does? He starts crying. He gets upset, really upset. And so my wife runs over, she sees this, and she pulls him aside. And she takes him and starts walking off. And she talks to him, and she says, hey, what's wrong? You know what he says? They're driving me crazy. I just can't take it anymore. And she says, what, buddy, what? He said, I had a really good idea on how to win the game. Let's don't throw anything over until the last 10 seconds. And nobody would listen to me. Where do quarrels and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires that battle within? You want something and you don't get it. You quarrel and you fight. And you know what Lisa told him? She pulled him aside and she said, hey, relax. Take a breath. Do you see all this? And she got him to stop for a minute and to look around. He goes, yeah. She said, it's all for you. All this is for you. It's for you to have fun. Hey, take a look. Take a look around the room. Look outside. Take a look at the world. You know what it is? It's all for you. God said, look, I made all of this for you. Why don't you enjoy it? Don't take yourself so seriously. Do you have to get your way? Let wisdom pour into your life. It's all for you. 
James says, hey, look, we do the same things. And it'd be one thing if we saw our bad character and were just honest about it and repented and said, yeah, what a dummy, what am I thinking? But that's rarely the case. Instead, you know what we do? We justify and we blame others for our, our unhappiness. We quarrel and fight. Do you know why that is? Here's why. Because most of us are wise in our own eyes. If you just play the game my way, we'd win. If you just do it my way, we'd be, be victorious. And it's a deception. You know what's really interesting? It is way harder to find someone who thinks they are a fool than to find someone who thinks they are wise. You know how hard you have to look to find someone who thinks they're wise? Not very far. Just look at the person next to you. We all think we're wise. And to that point, John MacArthur has a great quote I want to show you. If you'd read this for me, I'd appreciate it. Let me hear you read out loud. Most people have an elevated and unrealistically high opinion of their wisdom, although they might not say so. They believe they are just as savvy as the next person and that their opinion is usually better than anyone else's. John MacArthur, master theologian, great pastor, huge church. I agree with that statement he made. I thought, wow, that's exactly it. We all think that we're so wise. Next week, we're going to, excuse me, in two weeks after Ben Corson, we're going to look at some tools that James gives to really help us with this, and, and they're great tools. James reveals the true test if we're wise or not. You know what it is? Did you catch it? Did you see it? It's verse 13. Chapter 3, verse 13. This is the true test of wisdom. This is the wisdom test. Let's take it. And then we'll pre prepare our hearts for communion. <clears throat> the wisdom test. Look what he says. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by what? Good conduct. That his actions, his works, his behaviors are done with meekness and with wisdom. You know, one thing that I find helpful sometimes when I'm trying to really meditate on the word and understand it is I read what the opposite would be. Will you do that with me? I actually wrote these words in my Bible a long, long time ago, and, and let me read it with you. Verse 13, who is foolish and clueless among you? Let him show it by his corrupt conduct. That his actions, his behaviors, are done with arrogance and recklessness. Ouch. I do that sometimes. My conduct is with arrogance and recklessness. Wasn't well thought out. And here we see that the true test of wisdom is not a matter of intellect, but of character. Because wisdom is far more than head knowledge. Many of us know the right thing to do. But wisdom is more than head knowledge. Wisdom is the character to do the right thing. How many of us know that overeating is bad? How many people know that smoking is bad? If it was just knowledge, nobody would smoke. Nobody would overeat. But it's more than knowledge. It's character. Wisdom is character. We all know it's important to have good friends. And we all know that before we can have good friends, we must first what? Oh, we all know it. But how many of us have really good friends and invest in those relationships? Wisdom is more than knowledge. Godly wisdom produces godly character. Godly wisdom produces godly character, and it produces really fruitful relationships. I'm going to ask the men to uh, prepare the elements. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I want to leave you very quickly. I'm going to fly through this. I want to leave you. You can jot it down. Get ready to write quick. Seven, seven, signs that you're growing in godly wisdom taken right out of our text are you ready we'll look at more how to have the tools to do these things in two weeks but i want to give them to you real quickly seven 
signs that you're growing in godly wisdom. Number one, you're pure in heart. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. Pure. What does that mean? No hypocrisy in it. No self-interest in it. No ulterior motive. It's pure. It's pure. Your worth is not defined by your success, by your goals, by your accomplishments, by your failures. No, 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 no. Instead, your motives are pure. Instead, you're just filled with gratitude that Jesus loves you, that he died on the cross for you, that you're saved by grace. You're filled with gratitude. Your motives are pure, pure in heart. Number two, you can forgive quickly. You quickly forgive. Where do we get that? Well, James says that kind of wisdom is peaceable and it's full of mercy. You quickly forgive. Yeah, if you're pure in heart, if you forgive quickly, you're growing in godly wisdom. Number three, you love people for who they are, not for what you can get out of them. You love people for who they are, not for what you can get out of them. Where do you get that? Well, look what what it says. That the wisdom of God is without partiality. Wow, I really like you. You got a lot of money. Yeah, would you be my friend? Can I come to your house? Will you invite me over for dinner? Yeah, what are you doing? Yeah, you are, that's demonic wisdom. You're just being a friend to get something. And James says, that's not real wisdom. Real wisdom loves people for who they are, not for what you can get out of them. Are you a ministry leader? Well, be careful that you love people for who they are, not what you can get out of them. You have your own company? Oh, be careful. Number four, you submit to authority both God's authority and man's authority. You submit to authority. Where do you get that? Well, same verse. Look what it says. The wisdom that is from above is willing to yield. You submit to authority. Even when the authority is wrong, you submit to the authority. It's over you. It's godly. It's wisdom. It's just wisdom. Your life will go so far if you respect and honor the authority that is over you. Number five don't have to get your way to be happy. You don't have to have everybody play the game your way to still play the game. You don't, have to, you don't have to get your way to be happy. Where do you get that? Well, it says it's willing to yield. It's gentle. Number six, you enjoy serving others. Where do you get that? Well, the wisdom says the wisdom that is from above is meek and full of good fruits. Meek Yeah, meekness doesn't elevate self, it elevates others. That's what meekness does, serves others. I looked at this team, I tell you what, I am so proud of this church. I tell, I'm with pastors all the time, I tell them this all the time, you've probably heard me say it before. God has spoiled me rotten, I have the best congregation. You guys are amazing. I love how you serve. You're growing in wisdom when you enjoy serving others. And number seven. Know God's will, and you pray it into your life. Where do you get that? He says, You ask. You ask. You know God's will, and you pray it into your life. Christian, I want you to know if you're here this morning, you have that Bible on your lap for one reason and one reason only that you might know the will of God and live by it. And if you're praying this, Lord, I just want to know your will. Here's my recommendation to you. Open up your Bible because it's there. God's will is not a mystery. It's been clearly revealed, and he wants you to know it. Not only does he want you to know it, he wants you to pray it into your life. So instead of saying, oh, Lord, would you convict my brother? He really wronged me. No, no, no. Know God's will on that and pray this way. Lord, help me to turn the other cheek. Help me to see my brother for how you love him. Help me to show him the same grace that you show me day after day after day. Help me to show the same forgiveness and mercy and kindness and blessings that you pour on me when I totally don't deserve it. You know God's will and you pray it into your life. These are the attributes that you're growing in wisdom. And if you have them, oh, I tell you what, life and life abundant to the glory of Jesus Christ gentlemen are going to pass out the elements right now. They represent the blood and body of Christ.
May we hold them in great reverence. And may we hold them together as James leads us in song. And may you think about what Jesus did for you when we totally did not deserve it. His incredible grace and mercy.